Take a moment to think about your commute. Here, to work or school every morning, whichever comes to mind. Chances are that on your way here, to school or to work, you went to places that are very different to where you come from and where you're headed to. Today, I want to talk about my commute. The story I want to tell starts here, in the beautiful city of Medellin, Colombia. Well, not quite there. You're going to be tempted to think that light signals humanity. So where there's light, there's people. Sounds simple, but what happens in the mountains where the lights fade away? In reality, the story I want to tell starts here, in La Comuna 13, one of the poorest neighborhoods of the city I just showed you, and not coincidentally, one of those where the lights fade away. See, about a year ago, I was traveling to Medellin on vacation, and one day I was going to a natural park that is located far up the mountains. So the easiest way to get there was by taking the cable car, known there as the Metro Carmen. About halfway through the ride, we stopped at La Comuna 13, where the station was located to change cable cars. There, I learned that faces are the best storytellers. I shared looks with faces of anguish, hopelessness, and fear. Faces of hunger and, par and faces of parents who have lost their children to gang violence. As a result of this experience, I became deeply concerned about one of the greatest challenges of our time, turning our cities into more equitable places for everyone. Hence, when I came back home to Panama, I knew that I had to make some changes to my summer plans. And it was then when I decided to intern at the Panamanian National Assembly, looking to, make, looking to learn about the policy process and, in the meantime, hopefully make some contributions to better policy. Of this experience at the National Assembly, the most impactful part was my commute from my house to a lay state palace. See, it was only one mile, but it was a journey of contrast. It was a journey out of my comfort zone and into some of the many phases of Panama. But in order to understand why this commute was so impactful, you need to understand where I come from. I was born and raised in Bella Vista, where I continue to live today. A 2017 report published by the Panamanian Ministry of Economics and Finance found that Bella Vista has the lowest poverty rate of any corregimiento in the Republic of Panama, at under 1%. Fewer than one in every 100 people living in Bella Vista is impoverished. Now, at the, entire end, at the entire opposite end of the spectrum, we've got Kurundu, the place that I went through every single day for a month on my way to the National Assembly. Kurundu is the poorest neighborhood in Panama City. There, over one in every four people are impoverished. Just a little bit of the contrast that I saw. See, while well, only a mile away, the places I went through on my way to the National Assembly are worlds apart. But now, let me tell you a, bit, a little bit about what I saw while actually working at the National Assembly. In the month I spent there, I must have seen at least three protests, calling for action on a wide variety of issues ranging from corruption to lack of public health care spending. Every time, at least at the beginning anyway, I was hoping that legislators would arrive to the Assembly and tackle corruption head on. But time and time again, I was disappointed to see that that was not the case. And not only that, but I also watched as slave staters arrive through the assembly's gates in SUVs with tinted windows driven by chauffeurs, completely disconnected from the reality going on right in front of their eyes. This experience was a truly heartbreaking paradox, but it was my experience. I experienced a concerning degree of disconnect that exists between the people and those men to represent them. And I just can't believe how unaware I was of the extent of this disconnect before I traveled to Medellin. See, for me it was Medellin, but it could have happened anywhere. I could have started by showing you the contrast between Punta Pacifica and Localacaja, right here in Panama City. Or perhaps Petare, in Caracas, Venezuela. Or maybe even Lagos, Nigeria. Because this truly could have happened anywhere. See, urban poverty is a universal theme in our cities, and we can no longer continue to hide behind our cosmopolitan skylines. The world where we can all thrive is well within our reach, but it's going to require us to stand up to injustice for those helplessly sitting down, to raise our voices for the voiceless, and once and for all, to look beyond our privilege. I dream of the day 
when those who do this aren't called heroes. I dream of the day when they will just be called people, because everyone does it. And while we're on the subject of dreams, I have a question for you. I would like to know how you, the audience, stacks up in terms of political views. So first the right. Please raise your hand if you identify as being somewhere right of center, meaning that you believe in small government and some form of conservative views. Please raise your hand. Okay, we've got quite a bit of right of center people. Now we're going with the left. So if you identify as being somewhere left of center, meaning that you believe in somewhat bigger government and liberal values, please raise your hands now. So we've got a little bit more of lefties, I guess. Um, <laughs> At this point, I'm going to ask you to let go of all those ideas just for a couple of minutes. You can go back to your comfort zone afterwards. For now, you're entering a theater. I want to challenge you to suspend this belief. You're going to forget that human beings can fly. You're going to transport your mind to some place called Neverland, or Narnia, or Wakanda. <laughs> you choose. Ultimately, all I need of you is to open up your mind and play a game with me. So, Let's pretend you and I are all part of a panel trying to decide what to do to increase the number of years that children spend in schools. Let's say that we're living in a country, assuming, that has a school life expectancy of about seven years. So most children don't finish secondary school, if they get to secondary school. And we propose three options, and these are they. And we have $100 to spend in either of these three solutions. Number one would be to hire teachers and provide uniforms. Number two would be to cure children of their intestinal worms. And finally, number three would be to give scholarships and provide free meals. I'm going to ask you what you think is the best one. So please raise your hand if you think that number one is the best use of our hundred dollars. Please raise your hands. All right, number two, please raise your hands. And finally, number three. Thank you very much. I think that it's very interesting that you have a bit of a split the exercise that we did is not that different to how policymakers actually agree on what to do about these issues. See, while we do have a vote, we have legislators and ministers vote, perhaps. That doesn't mean that they have all the data behind the solutions that they're coming up with. They're often just voting based on a gut feeling, and that gut feeling is often prompted by, by why, what are their political ideologies, by the narratives that play out in this situation. Now, let me tell you what is the most effective solution, because I think you're all wondering. So, Options one and three, for every hundred dollars, they raise the school life expectancy by somewhere between one and three years. In contrast, option two, curing children of intestinal worms, increases school life expectancy by as much as 30 years per hundred dollars spent. What you can see here is that, especially based on the fact that, kind of in the straw poll, I think that most of you chose option three. What you can see is that, or we often think of as conventional wisdom, it seems like you're attacking the problem at its root. It's often synonymous with us assuming that we know what people need better than they do themselves. And that is the fundamental mistake of how we make policy. Now, the solution to filling that void is exactly what I just showed you, data. The fact that we went through this process is extremely helpful. And this is a trend that has been adopted by many countries and cities throughout the world. A trend called taking the guesswork out of policy. For instance, there is the example of the city of Baltimore in Maryland, in the United States of America. This city has one of the highest crime rates of the United States. It has had for several decades. At some point in the 90s and early 2000s, they implemented this program in which instead of calculating crime rate data per year, which is what most places do, and then allocate their budget based on the areas that, were, that had the highest crime rates last year, they significantly decreased that time span. They did it by weeks, or by days, or perhaps even by hours. And they were extremely successful at decreasing their crime rate almost in half in only a decade. What we can see from this is that our political views can often get in the way of us getting to the right solutions, the solutions that are most effective. And that favors no one. That favors not you because you have to pay the taxes for those solutions that are not effective. Neither does it favor the people who are actually affected by those issues directly. So, what I believe that can be our best alternative is to live in a post-ideological world, one in which we can be idealistic without being ideological, at least at the time when we're discussing solutions. This would play out like a world in which we do not do what sounds better, but rather what works better, leaving the narratives out of the picture. And now, as I'm about to leave this stage, 
I have a confession to make. I am not good at conclusions. As a result, today I have decided to do something a little different. I'm going to try to summarize the takeaways of this experience in which I shared my views about inequality, my experience working at the National Assembly, and finally, what I believe could be a solution to this. I have decided to summarize the takeaways to report. Let's see how that goes. Society is telling us, dream but be realistic. Speak confidently, but not too much and not too loud, and be bold, but do not dare to defy. Reach for the stars, but allow yourself to fall short. After all, we can only do so much. Do not dare to reach so far and so fast that you shatter the ceiling. And if you do, don't forget to pick up the pieces and put them back together. Because there's a reason why it was there in the first place. Someone stands to gain, and that someone wants you to believe it's you, but no. Every second that you stay quiet is a setback. Every day that you wake up and choose to conform is a step backwards in the grand scheme of things, and it takes time. But most importantly, it takes courage. It takes courage to stand up and play a game that appears to be rigged against you. But it's the only way out. And see, I don't care if it's 3 a.m. or 6 p.m. because it's long overdue. It's time. It's time we stand up for La Comuna Teresa and Kurundu. It's time we stand against the injustice going on around us. It's time for our cities to stop being accomplices to the oppression of our circumstances. We have been commuting for long enough. Why not now? Thank you. <laughs>